If you run around in architecture, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, Ms. Caroline Bos, but if you run around in architecture for such a long time and you still manage to make such an inspiring uh, and uh, renewing thoughts about architecture, then you must be something really special. She's co-founder of UN Studios and she's an urban planner. She's called Caroline Bos. I'm very honored to uh, introduce you, Ms. Bos. Thank you very much. And again, also uh, for me, thank you all very much for coming today, in the, despite whether that would invite you to go maybe cycling or rowing or something much uh, more fun than uh, this. But um, we will have, I think, an, uh, a nice day together anyway. I will stand here because I'm a bit shy, but also because I need to press the button on this uh, thing. But um, what I, yeah, le le let me also uh, recap recapitulate a little bit the goal of uh, our, our UN Studio goal here today is to explore together what, what it means, what, it's, what it takes to become a co-creative practice, which is our aim now. And what also knowledge sharing, which is what we are about to do and what we, what we are launching, um, what, what, does, what does it really mean and what does it take? And also, why are we doing it actually? <laughs> Why, why do we want to do that? We will probably still have two phases. We see the two phases of US Studio here. On the one hand, we, we want to become, we want to share all, all the knowledge that we are, have co-created, are going to co-create, and really see the new focus of, of architecture as, as a knowledge-based practice. On the other hand, we also still going to make things in the world and, and as this uh, wonderful young woman, uh, a Chinese construction worker, is, is helping us also make, um, make, uh, make these things. So we are not only um, a knowledge practice in, in a virtual form. So let me first, uh, before we go further into, this, um, into the knowledge practice, give a little bit of a, the background um, of UN Studio. We, um, yeah, we started this drive towards this knowledge sharing about three years ago and we, we have also, besides these external brainstorms, we also internally um, worked on that and here you can see a lot of, or several of the people who are here also today, um, yeah, uh, thinking, about, rethinking our work and um, um, uh, yeah, trying to, to open the discussion up and open the work up and, and see it with new eyes in all sorts of ways, where it's not so much about the project anymore, but far more about the processes leading up to it and the thoughts going into it and the aims and ambitions with it. These are the knowledge platforms that we have been um, working with these past three years, and these, so these are the sort the themes that that we are um, focusing our um, internal um, research on. This is also now going a little bit into all these this, as Luca said, very long period of time leading up to it, 25 years in uh, practice this year, UN Studio. This is our the office uh, that we have, our headquarters in um, Amsterdam, which um, yeah, we started 25 years ago, and also now have a second office in um, Shanghai. And in that time, we, we have done, we've been very driven always to, to practice a lot, to learn really through through doing. So we have done, we've been a little bit hyperactive maybe, you could put a label on it, ADHD, I don't know, but I've done a lot in, in, uh, in all these years. And, and, and also the last 10, 12 years, more and more, um, all over the world. 
which we always wanted to do, which we thought was, was very interesting and challenging. And for that reason, even uh, we studied abroad. And even when we did not have as much work outside the Netherlands, the, the, internally we were already very international uh, with the people who were working with us. And besides the, um, the architectural uh, projects, which make up a lot of the profile of Human Studio, we've also always done a lot of urban work. And uh, we see here some examples of, and that's also still a very important uh, um, yeah, aspect of Human Studio, and, and also an important aspect, therefore, of knowledge development. But actually, as we can see here also from some um, yeah, snapshots of the daily practice, it, it can take all uh, um, scales. We bridge all the scales. Here we have the Erasmus Bridge, one of our first signature project in the Netherlands, big new urban bridge in um, Rotterdam. But we also here have a sketch for a school, and as that shows, we also bridge all sorts of media. We, we, we don't of course, most of the work is now 3D, but we, um, we work also. We still sketch, make models and so on. We, so we very, try to be very open-minded on that. And about, uh, oh yeah, 14, 15 years ago, we, we already um, reformulated our practice for the first time. Before that, we'd been more traditional architectural practice called Van Berkel and Bos, so named after the two co-founders, Ben Van Berkel and myself. And then through projects like the Erasmus Bridge, we already saw that the role of the architect was, um, was one uh, which really uh, entails the network. So we, have to, we saw that the architect is just someone within a network, and in a network, you, you have to work very intensively with, um, with others. You have to also create the network almost on a daily basis. You have to, um, uh, as, as uh, Bruno Latour calls it, enroll people. You have to um, convince people and they convince you of, of the value of what you are doing. So this uh, network experience of, of complex, intricate projects that have to be done together is um, at the basis of UN Studio and now taken, we realize now through five, 15 years of network practice that it goes even further and it has to become a co-creative practice. And that network practice is so pervasive that it makes you see that it doesn't really matter so much what you do, it goes this applies to all scale levels, but to the smallest one and the largest one, because the relational aspect is more important. And that, um, that was the manifesto we wrote with that image um, at the front of it, um, emphasizing that relational aspect of architecture and urbanism, also including product, products. And that means that a a relational approach means that you um, use all the ingredients of architecture, the structure, the circulation system, the way the program is distributed in the space. You try to capture that in one gesture. And this is an example of how we do that. We see um, a grid, um, which is, of course, a three-dimensional grid, which pulled uh, pulled apart, thereby creating interstitial spaces which then can be used up for um, circulation, construction, uh, letting light in. So, and, um, a very um, yeah, the, the, uh, integral approach, and which you see at all different scale levels. We see it in, in, um, in the way, in, the, in this rough model, we see it in the way we can, you can treat 
a ground plane, lifting it up, creating space underneath it. And, and you can see it in, in the way we would make a table, which becomes an integral element of table and uh, seating um, element, and uh, then becomes a sit table. And you can see also in an observation of how the city works traditionally, for instance, here in Wuhan, where you, where you have here um, the daily cooking breakfast that you can cook, and there already someone is uh, busy in her sewing practice, and they are just at different uh, diagonal levels. And, and this is also something we yeah, you could say that this is an urban observation that as well can translate to the um, to to the scale of the um, industrial. And the same here, uh, we see the industrial object has some relations to the approach also uh, of the urban design, where also the the multiple ground levels are very important. So um, this, this aspect of the relational view of architecture and design at all its levels is, is a founding principle that has eventually led us to where we are here today. And the other aspect is that of um, the network and co-creation. And even um, in 2001 was the first uh, attempt already at co-creation when we participated with a whole group of architects in um, a uh, competition for Ground Zero after 9-11 in New York. And uh, although this, these projects were early attempts and of course they came to nothing in, in more recent projects that again will not come to anything because always we have to uh, have a lot of failure before we achieve something. In, in Los Angeles, a project, again, is, is a, a form of co-creation that we uh, engage in more and more. But this is then a project, it's in China, um, that also follows those same principles of a relational approach and a more co-creative approach, and that will be, that, or that's now under construction in China. And in fact, the very first image of the Chinese lady was taken there on the side. So then, now where we are today, no, um, realizing more and more that we that that the no, the knowledge base that we have built up is um, really the most maybe the most interesting uh, uh, part of of our practice and most interesting thing that we do and also where the, the aspect where we can innovate in most, because design now today is questionable. How much innovation is there possible? For us, it seems that, that it's, it's the not as stimulating, not as fascinating and uh, challenging as, um, as, as knowledge innovation is. So what, mm, summing up, a little bit again where where we so where we stand with this we have built up uh, a long experience and a lot of knowledge in the field of architecture but also in urban design and there are there we specially fascinated in where they overlap where they where you get these relational aspects and also in um, interior projects and, and exhibitions and pavilions as again an area of overlap where we see so much these relational values that um, interest us. Um, industrial design and furniture design and product design is another area where we have knowledge and expertise and we've worked in in the world. So, the, so what we are then saying now and asking ourselves and asking you and hopefully can discuss today. Now, if we take this step of the relational even further and we look at where everything overlaps and then there we find maybe the most uh, interesting and important questions of today and also we can find maybe there some clues of where we should look at for the future. And so these um, these knowledge platforms that we've been working with, they are all in that field where all these different um, 
genres and typologies and questions can overlap. And um, this, we can say, is really a form of strategic design that, that points us towards the future then. And, um, and, and so there, that's what the things that we want to share and um, discuss. But also, so we, we have uh, things to offer and, and things to discuss in the field of knowledge and innovation. And we are also aware that it's, that it's difficult. If you look at facts uh, relating to innovation, um, I, I, I have been told that 80% of innovation uh, that occurs within companies comes from the outside. It's, it's, it's very rare to develop true innovation completely inside. There's also, uh, it's also very expensive. It, it takes about five years of um, research and development before you have a, a viable innovation. Plus, it's very difficult to, to get out of your own industry, to change your mindset. And, and I think that third point is something that we, that, that those, um, that we work on very hard by emphasizing the relational approach, but also the sessions that you just saw where we're all sticking colored uh, post-it notes on the wall. And also with the um, knowledge platforms themselves and, and the knowledge we also um, yeah, worked on, on, especially on this, um, point of, of seeing things as not as rigid, not as contained within one discipline, but really as, as relational. And for even, for instance, um, economic factors are very important, of course, in, in um, architecture. So we know from experience that we cannot, of course, we all want to be sustainable, uh, you would, you know, zero carbon and so on. We all would want that, but um, we have to, it's that those um, solutions are also very expensive often. So we then realize they must, that must be in balance also with, with other factors. And so it, it has to become attainable instead of 100% sustainable. These are then some of these, uh, some again, very, ex it's an experimental project that's not going to be realized, but it's, it's an instance of, of how design, our design would look like um, based on, on this, um, on, on this um, idea of um, sustainability in relation to, to a whole host of parameters. And this, these are examples also of the sort of knowledge that we would share, the experience of um, how we came to certain solutions um, as a result of different uh, analyses and different um, yeah, uh, parametric techniques combined with, for instance, um, ener energy analyses. Then there are very um, yeah, specific um, solutions as well um, that, that we develop relating to uh, maybe urban uh, choices, how we, how we create um, more uh, di differentiation and variation in a volume and in a facade distribution by subtly rotating the floor plan, for instance, and, and then uh, how, how can we gain control over that sort of design decision to, to make it again attainable? And that those are um, yeah, real life experiences that we have um, undergone. And same with that project now under construction in, um, in China is an example of a, a very tall, um, tall structure, it's sort of twin towers that are positioned uh, diagonally, creating a, an, um, a public podium underneath, um, letting in light through these shapes, uh, cut out shapes from above, 
Um, so there's many different experiences with public projects, with residential projects that yeah, have led to um, these design decisions and being able to carry them through in all, in all the details. Another example of the sort of, of knowledge, so it's, it's very uh, specific knowledge often in our cases and um, can, here in, it's about, an, um, in this case it's about a material where we, um, it's already an older project but, it, but um, this is an, um, uh, this, this is an, um, a material that we sort of invented in an uh, accidental way as the, we discovered a colored foil that had been actually discarded by the manufacturer but because it was too vibrant but by um, putting it uh, in between two glass plates we, we found that it was an excellent internal facade material. Production techniques uh, are another example and um, for instance this project is an, um, an uh, exercise in um, a very thin uh, um, concrete uh, material is, is being developed currently so we are together with the um, producer of that concrete looking at an, uh, at an interesting application of, of, of a new material. Then, um, of course, very important aspect today, the parametric techniques, and uh, we are very lucky here today to have the Yuma Studio experts on that, and so please don't ask me anything about it. Uh, and uh, a project that we've been um, working on in um, Abu Dhabi for several years ago um, that also is a real exploration of, mater of new materials, uh, a new urban constellation. And then it's very nice to put forward a design like that, but you know, can you, realize, can you then realize it and how do you do that? Often, uh, yeah, when I give a presentation somewhere, at the end of it, um, a, a nice architect will, will, will ver ask a very honest and very open question, but how did you, how, how can you realize this? How can you really make it? Because it's, it's um, very often the case for architects that they make a, a very interesting design, but it leads to a long road of compromise because it's very difficult to, uh, to realize it within the means available. And this is, yeah, that, um, the, the, yeah, our luck because of having practiced so intensely for such a, yeah, very long time. <laughs> I repeat it again. <laughs> Just it was just my birthday this week, so <laughs> I feel a bit old today. <laughs> but um, this, that, and and having done so much, that you, um, yeah, that there are that we have got some some shortcuts. We have learned some some smart ways. Smart. It's all about smartness to learn how to really make something that looks very irregular, asymmetric, extremely expensive, also possible uh, technically. Um, so the um, yeah, this is the f f very difficult to explain, but different as we distinguish now also different aspects that. Um, link maybe uh, projects together in an, um, in, a, in an thematic way. For instance, we see that a lot of our design is then based on aspects of duration and time and so we make our own history and thereby question what will be, what's the future of this form of 
of design. Material dualities is another topic that we can see. We see a lot of that uh, happening and where is that, uh, where can that provide a real social solution also? Um, the monolithic, the architecture as a monolith as, or as a transparent monolith maybe is another theme we see in our work. And then finally something that we uh, that, that we see that, that we are really um, have, have invested in a lot over the years is, is the uh, sort of new invention of the void. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry that I'm uh, dumping <laughs> so much information on you at this early moment of the day, but um, uh, I hope to have offered just some starting points for a conversation and really look forward to hearing a lot from you. I think that's what the most important thing will be today. So thank you very much and let's soon discuss. Lucas. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, please stay there so we can ask a few questions. I will, I will ask the first one and then you will ask the second one, okay? Um, first, you are a, you, at one point you sounded a bit skeptical about how much innovation can we realize in design. You say we can probably, it's easier in, no, it's not easier, but it's uh, in, in knowledge innovation is something you understand better than design or that you have more belief in than design innovation. Do you make... Uh, a difference there between product design and architecture or architectural design or do you think it's one thing? Um, I, I think it's um, yeah I, I, it's, I will speak only for myself because I think it's um, uh, difficult to say for instance it really depends on the status of, of a certain discipline at, at a certain moment um, architecture design I think has grown incredibly in, in the, the years that, that uh, we've been in practice. When we started out in the late 80s, uh, architecture was, was, there was, not, was quite conservative, was not so much happening, and, it's become, it, and it was not very communicative. And it didn't use many contemporary techniques at all. It was really still very traditional, and it has opened up a lot. And, and we can be critical about that because it has also led to uh, I, the icon architecture a lot and, and uh, of, of every building competing to be more extravagant than its neighbor. So, so this is a point of criticism now and maybe by saying this, I acknowledge that, yes, let's not uh, invest too much anymore in making architecture more designy, let's, let's find it in another way. But for, for urbanism, I would not argue that case. I think urbanism is now where architecture was 25 years ago. It's still very much stuck in the past. It doesn't use uh, many new techniques and it's not at all communicative. So I think that they need, urbanists need to catch up a little bit with architecture. And as for industrial designers, mm, I. I think maybe it could, yeah, I, I don't want to, no, I would like to hear back. I, I don't, I couldn't say, make a judgment on it. Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah that's, that's, that's clear. And then, uh, the one, you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, my question is, uh, hello, my name is Angela Totz. Uh, I'm an architect from Berlin, uh, working on architecture communication. And my question is, um, do you actually, believe that uh, architecture is following society by giving the develop developments a form? Mm -hmm. Or do you think architecture should be pre preceding and uh, taking part in shaping society? That's mm. my question. Yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, immediately <laughs> the, 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 yeah, to the heart of the discussion. Great, great question. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that, that architecture uh, has its own perception of itself in relation to society and be very conscious, if you, very, to, you have to be very conscious of both, I think, of both the internal discourse of architecture and um, societal 
discourses. Um, to, to say architecture follows society is also not possible. Societies are very uh, big, complex, goes in, in many directions. So, so architecture is lucky to have some kind of backbone that gives you also a lot how to, how to reflect on society, how to look at it in, in a way that, that, that is uh, good. Uh, sort of thing, more, more like a comment or? Yeah, I think architecture gives us a reflection of, of, so, of a society. A society can never get another architecture than uh, what it really wants. Yeah, yeah. So are the, is the Abu Dhabi project a typical Abu Dhabi project in a political context of Abu Dhabi? Um, yeah, in many ways. Yeah. In, in many ways it is. It, it's, um, it actually was a, uh, a media center that they mm. were planning. So it was also, it was a whole complex of uh, television studios, but also academies, startups, to, to uh, media, uh, everything related to media. And, and it's, um, it has some kind of screens, uh, head. It, it projects all these different screens also. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, yeah, a comment also on that a bit, yeah. yeah. There's a question over there. Yes, uh, my name is Günther Tau from the company TBS from Berlin. And um, I would like to come back to your uh, sentence that uh, the innovation cycle takes at minimum five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it's the case in architecture, but when I'm looking on industry, on the industry, you know, the, the innovation cycle's getting shorter and shorter. That means, you know, maybe uh, 30 or even up to 40% of the products will come to the market in the next two or three years. Really? Are actually, uh, well, still in the development pipeline. So I think the, the the cycle is getting shorter and shorter. Well, that, that's very encouraging. Uh, it's great news. I I, uh, I hope that that uh, yeah would be uh, the case for everyone. I must say, yeah, architecture is exceptionally slow. We often cannot use also a material that's innovative because uh, by law it's required to have a 10 year. Uh, warranty on the material and if it's so if it's a very new material the manufacturer won't be able to provide it so you run up against all sorts of regulatory problems also were you never tempted by industrial design uh, miss boss because if you go to Milan you see designers experimenting with a certain material and uh, boom 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 next year or even immediately there is a product and we'll see how things go and if yeah. it, if the, the chair collapse so what so uh, no, yeah, yeah you know don't, it's don't, not as extreme luckily, uh, but here in the west we don't say that about the building but no exactly you cannot do yeah. it in architecture yeah. but this well, were you never tempted yeah. Yeah. by design because this more of looser uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, i know yeah yeah, and, and I suppose you, we, we, we can think like that, not literally, but then, you know, let it inspire us in some way. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, j just a small question again. You know, you're talking about the materials and the laws, but when it comes to material, we have to take into uh, our minds that uh, the efficiency is more and more a very interesting part of materials, even of the existing materials. And if you introduce new methods like 3D printing, you know, or, or using more algorithm to find out, the, to make the material more efficient, mm -hmm. then there could be a big jump. Let's say, yeah. you know, in, uh, if, if you look well on, on different architectural monuments like the Stadium of Munich, I can't remember the architect who has built it. Yes, and, yes, and he's, he was very efficient in this sense, you know. So uh, that could help us, I think, a lot because there's a huge campaign now in Germany regarding material efficiency because when it comes to a product, well, I'm only talking about now industrial product, nearly only 3% goes into the part of energy of the costs, mm -hmm. 15 to 18% goes into labor costs, mm -hmm. but I think 40 to 50% are material efficient. And then, and if, you are, you, if we are using the ABC analysis or Pareto optimum, <laughs> then we should maybe more put a focus on the material efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, and hybrid materials like that foil in that building that I showed you, it has an enormous effect on that, uh, it's in a courtyard on that space. And the, it's not that the whole material has to be uh, uh, reinvented. Hello, uh, I'm Mirko Becker from the Städler School in Frankfurt. Um, I've got, I mean, it's interesting the, the notion of, um, of innovation in design. Um, but what kind of is my question, and I haven't really an answer for that yet, is um, kind of previously, as I said, there was, uh, where there was no innovation, where there was basically a drive for novelty or a notion of avant garde in architecture. That was kind of discussed in a circle of uh, or kind of in an architectural theory discourse. Um, so the question is whether we need nowadays, as we kind of tend or strive towards innovation, a different kind of discourse or even a different type of theory or have to look for an alternative than yeah. architectural theory where actually in innovation is evaluated. Yeah. And that helps to reflect whether something is innovative or just novel. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that, that very strongly. I think that, uh, for instance, for sustainability, it's a real problem that we don't have a strong internal theoretical discourse that, uh, had, that supports that from within for architecture. So it's always, I mean, we talk a lot about um, passive and active and add-on and so on, but still it's, it, it will only be, I think, a very strong um, thing in architecture if there is also, if it's completely one-on-one -on -one overlap with, um, with a real discourse that, that that's also, um, yeah, uh, is in line with that whole history of discourses in architecture. As long as it doesn't feel right completely in that way, uh, it will be very difficult. It will always be, uh, yeah, not not completely inherent uh, to architecture itself. Yeah. Last uh, last question. I'm Helena from the Institute for Computational Design in Stuttgart, and I have um, a question which obviously bothers me a lot because we work with uh, robots and digital technologies. And I was wondering um, in how, f I mean, for us, innovation happens um, clearly through digitally controlled processes um, in connection with materials. And I can't, um, I can think, see that this is strongly a very big stream of innovation happening across the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering in how far the offices or an office like yours is considering um, taking that right into the office, i.e. buying a robot, experimenting mm. with materials. Um, yeah. yeah, we, um, we, uh, we would, I think a robot would be great. Uh, <laughs> I come across them more and more, you know, when you visit now an, uh, an academic institution, maybe in, in Barcelona or, or uh, even in Al Sharjah, was they all have robots. So I do uh, think, yeah, where's our robot? <laughs> but, uh, no, it, absolutely. But we are very, um, we will never get something for the sake of it. We, uh, with you and Studio, we will never let the technology become completely leading because that we would, um, yeah, that this is, I think, something that architecture, we had a discussion about it. Uh, I can't remember now who is, but yeah, internally also. Um, Oh yeah, we had an, we had actually uh, this we rehearsed we had a general rehearsal of this conference internally uh, last Friday in the office, and so we talked with the whole office about the same sort of topics, and and this is maybe a problem that architecture um, was so much using uh, the technologies that were coming from other industries, especially relating to computers. So we we would find uh, animation programs in Los Angeles not used for our and then we say well what could we do with it as architects and that's how it all started and 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 that's maybe mm, there would be the same thing with robots you'd get this big robot and then think 
what could we let the robot do? Yeah. Uh, maybe short, uh, so from this side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we will see a little bit only later in the workshops. We don't really have a big presentations on the content of the knowledge platforms today. But um, very shortly, also I'm uh, leading the smart parameter platform in the office. We don't have a presentation today, but uh, obviously the, um, we don't have a robot. It's, uh, I tried to get it in the budget for next year. It didn't quite work out. Yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, we do have uh, several techniques in the office, uh, a very active uh, model room with, uh, with 3D printers. So we have one 3D printer for our kind of daily 3D printing on, on models, but also uh, looking to other ways. How can we really um, bring it a step further? So we have another 3D printer just for testing purposes on, on design. So really. Uh, on the quick one, uh, very cheap 3D printer, um, how can these really inform the, the design process? That's on, on, let's say, our side. And of course, on the fabrication, that's a whole uh, different scale. And, and mostly in that case, we, we search the opportunities to work together with companies, because we, we probably can't find, uh, find the, the, the money to find a robot for in-house. But it's, uh, in, in each project, we will, not, we will never be the one fabricating the, the piece at the end. So uh, we search the, the collaboration with practices, and then uh, that specialist in, in, uh, sometimes in universities, but also uh, fabricators. We're doing, a, at the moment, a workshop where we uh, actually took an idea of, of uh, folding metal with robots, but then doing it by hand with a, just a different material, which is a composite that, uh, that you don't need the robot. So we, we're looking with a company, how can we uh, actually uh, use the curve folding with, uh, by hand instead of a robot, and then bring it in, in a... In a, also to the, to the building industry directly into a project, because uh, at the moment we can't afford a robot on, on the site yet. And uh, that's, that, that's maybe, the, um, maybe one, uh, one little aspect of it. So we search for collaborations. That's also why, uh, why you are all here. That's, uh, we, we, fi we find that most of the, the answers we find in direct communication with, uh, with the builders and uh, with the companies in between, and uh, yeah, in, in, uh, through projects. And the robots still have to be... Uh, <laughs> this was Mark Hoppelman from the uh, UN Studios, uh, one of the many Germans that are working in the uh, <laughs> uh, so. last, last question from, uh, from Ronan. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Ronan Kadushin. I'm a designer from uh, Berlin. Uh, on the first slides, you were talking about co-creation and collaboration. I would like to, from, uh, with, with outside elements that, that is not your company. Could you please elaborate? Uh, Yeah. Um, well, when so when we first this is yeah a, a question of, of, of a progressing insight. Eh? So already after really engaging uh, as as young architects on on large projects, we realized it is a que it is the network that does it. It's not so much the architect or the architect you have to see is is a network is and um, but but then. Um, yeah, then nowadays it goes much further. It, it's not even that you, um, that we realize it is um, not, not the authorship is, is very, is very diffuse too. Yeah? But you can think in the network still of a contained node, you know, the, the, the person in it is, is, each one is a contained node. I think now we see it far more um, as a mesh work, we are all equal strands in, in a mesh. And um, so it's not the case that, that we are node and, and exerting influence and distributing the knowledge. No, it's, it's really a, a weaving together of different um, forms of knowledge. And um, so we, yeah, we, we um, w so we have uh, opened, uh, opened up to that far more and um, yeah so we um, we we see the, um, the 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 products that we do if it is an for instance a knowledge project product also it is something that is co-created by bringing different forms of knowledge together and that's that's when you yeah can create a new unique piece of knowledge or or product yeah. Thanks. Thanks again. We will applaud. I will applaud for you, uh, <laughs> well, Ms. Boss. Thank you very, thank you very much. much.